Hello. OK. So I thought I was going to have 40 minutes. I have about 40 minutes, but uh, this will be good. All right, so throwing together distributed services with gEvent. This is an extreme talk. So you all know what gEvent is, right? OK, because we're not going to really talk about it. Um, we're going to talk about uh, something that we use at Twilio to, to basically throw together distributed services. Uh, it's a service micro framework. It's like a web framework, but for not web stuff. Uh, for building services. Um, and it's called Ginkgo, previously known as G-Service, if any of you have been following any of that. So at Twilio, uh, we have very sort of service-oriented architecture, lots of little services um, all over the place. This is a simplified version. It really doesn't map to it at all. It just looks cool. Um, and so uh, thinking about services uh, at a high level, um, you can think of conceptually there's the Twilio service. Right. Are you uh, you're familiar with Twilio? It's an API for making and receiving phone calls and SMS messages and stuff like that. Um, so Twilio as a service, high level service, um, is made up of three maybe subservices, um, these products, SMS, client, voice. Um, and these are actually made up of actual services. Uh, these guys here which have random names that you don't know what they do. Um, but these are the services that we run that are written in Twisted or G-Event or whatever. But you can actually break those down into subservices. Uh, Matrix, for example, which you have no idea what it does, but it has a WebSocket service, an HTTP service, and some random thing called JetMesh. Uh, and JetMesh happens to have a client and a server because it's sort of this peer-to-peer -peer thing. Um, and you can you know, break these things down. It's basically a service hierarchy. This is about service composition. And so this has been an interesting way to think about building uh, services, especially complex services, large systems. So uh, what Ginkgo does is it gives you one primitive, basically, uh, service that you inherit from. And your services are basically classes. Services are just nested modules at a high level, conceptually. Uh, and, and using this uh, sort of nested module concept, you can pretty easily throw together um, these nice components um, that you can kind of throw together and reuse and uh, build cool stuff. They basically all they do is start, stop, and reload, and nest. Um, but this little bit of convention, uh, and they also have configuration, and they can be run as daemons. Um, this little bit of structure and convention actually goes quite a long way. Um, so what we're going to do here is we're going to. I try. I wanted to do live coding, but they wouldn't let me. Um, we're going to build a scalable gateway to a random number service. Random number service is just some contrived thing. Uh, it could be, in a real world, maybe a database or some other service. But this gateway that's built around a self-organizing messaging system. So we're actually using a, a generic messaging system to act as the gateway uh, that's self-organizing in terms of cluster. It's actually horizontally uh, scalable. Um, and you can just add new nodes. And it doesn't depend on any sort of like uh, zookeeper or doozer or anything like that. It's all um, self-contained. So we're going to do this by building a couple of services. First, we're going to build a simple number service, TCP server and client, basic stuff. The server is just going to spew out random numbers when you connect to it. Uh, then we are going to build a very generic pub sub service uh, that uses HTTP. So when you post to it, it's a publish. When you get, you're going to get a, a Twitter streaming API kind of thing, a chunk transfer encoding. And, uh, and every, every path is a channel. And then we're going to take that, combine it with the client we made before to make the gateway service. So then you could connect with HTTP or WebSocket or whatever else that we throw in there. Um, and then that would provide an interface to our number service, which is over TCP and in our back end or whatever. And then that is uh, something that we need to uh, make distributed so that we can have this uh, gateway cluster. So you can talk to any of the nodes, and they'll all kind of work together magically. Um, and then, of course, there's only one. Uh, in, in this contrived example, the leader is going to have the connection to the number server. So ultimately, our service hierarchy is going to look like this. Off to the top right, you have the number server that's going to be running independently as a process. And then we're going to build up this number gateway thing from these subcomponents. Um, we're going to build them independently and then put them together and refactor them and blah, blah, blah. Um, so we're going to start with the building the number server and client. And this will give you idea, an idea of actually building something with this. So can you all see this? 
um, or do you prefer it to look like this? This, okay. Two is better, okay. Um, so just so that you know what we're working in, because we're gonna, this, this project directory, we're gonna have, um, so we have a configuration directory. Um, these configuration files are basically how we, how we run daemons. Um, and then we have the actual module, G tutorial, which has the modules that we're gonna have in it. And then you can ignore all these other scripts. So we basically have one module, the numbers module. And um, here's our server. So like I said, inheriting from service, it's, uh, and then we have some configuration. Um, so basic primitives for basically setting up uh, your configuration for your service. Um, and then it turns out all we're doing is adding a, the G event uh, stream server as a, as a child service and setting up the handler. So services can, base, like I said, start, stop, and reload. They can also restart, but that's just start and stop. Um, and, but you have these hooks. Basically, when you start it, it's gonna start all its child services and call its hook, uh, call, call its uh, do start hook. And when you call stop, it's gonna call, call stop on all its child services. And uh, it's also a container for greenlets, so it'll kill any greenlets that are running. We'll get to that. Um, but this is pretty simple. All it's doing is setting up a G event server and, and setting up this handler, which says, for every connection, produce some random numbers in a loop, spit them out, uh, sleep for 60 seconds divided by the emit rate, which we have in our configuration uh, set here, or as where it's defined and how we access it through this descriptor. Uh, so the way we run this, uh, like I said, is with this configuration. So here's our configuration. Uh, it's just a Python file, like some other cool Python systems. You just define some variables. They're mapped to uh, the name that was defined when you set up setting. And then uh, you also define your service factory. Um, some of this might be familiar with, if, if, if you've used Twisted's uh, service or application stuff, it's somewhat inspired by that. Um, anyway, we're just instantiating, uh, service is just gonna instantiate a number server. And then if we run this, whoa. So we have a, uh, Ginkgo has a runner, sort of like Twisty, uh, but for G event and stuff like that. Config, uh, numbers. So we run it, it's running. Um, when we do netcat, we get random numbers. Um, and of course we can stop it. And uh, the runner also lets you do start, stop, all that stuff, manage the service, takes care of the PID file and all that stuff. It can daemonize, uh, well it daemonize, but it can true and all this other stuff. So we're gonna start it uh, in the background and check to see that it's still running or is running. And uh, one of the cool things about the configuration system, like why I have this configuration system, we can change, change the configuration. And uh, you see the emit rate is about one every second, and we reload, and it changes. And that was just because all we did was uh, accessed it through the emit, uh, the emit rate descriptor. And so it knows it'll just reload the configuration and because we, uh, it's used in the loop, it'll change dynamically. Um, so that's one, one, one advantage of using this. So uh, let's build a, or look at the client. Um, I'm actually going to slow this down again. It's too fast for me. Okay. Um, so let's look at the uh, client. We're gonna we build a client. Or actually, I already built a client. Imagine me just like writing all this in real time. I was gonna do it, no, I don't know. There's too much. Um, so here's the client uh, service. Um, it's very similar except we're actually doing something different. We're creating a client. So um, we're, we call self.spawn. Uh, we basically wrap some of the G event stuff so that uh, when you wanna spawn a greenlet, you spawn it relative to your service. And then it goes into a pool for your service so that when you call stop on your service, it'll kill all those and it's just a nice kind of container for your greenlets. I mean, where do you put your greenlets otherwise? Um, so it makes services kind of self-contained. Um, spawn is gonna call connect uh, in a greenlet and it's going to connect and then go into a loop where it reads off the socket and then put it into, puts it into a queue. But um, services can be anything, like we, we're not, we don't like impose anything on your constructor or anything like that. We just have these hooks. Um, that uh, you have, 
And so you can do anything. You can basically make the interface whatever you want. In this case, we're going to make it an iterator so that we just pull stuff off the queue. Um, so that's a pretty simple client. And we could make a configuration to run it as a, as a daemon, but we don't really want to. We could, let's just make a regular Python script um, that does this. And so you can just instantiate a service, and you can call start and stop, or it's a context manager, so you can just call with. And so you can just uh, with client and then iterate on it, right, and print that out. So we could do that. And we have the same thing. We have a client. OK, so that's our, our uh, number service. Um, and it gives you an idea of actually building something in this. Um, so now we're going to build the, uh, the pub sub thing, HTTP thing. We're going to start with a module called uh, a service called HTTP streamer. And, uh, All right, so we have a new module in here under messaging called HTTP. Sorry, let me fix this. All right, so there's not a whole lot here. Um, we have a subscription thing, which basically wraps a queue. Queues are pretty cool. Uh, HTTP streamer is a service. It's got some settings. Um, it's got a subscription dictionary because it's managing subscriptions. Um, and then we, we uh, compose it with uh, the gevent whiskey server. And then we just create a whiskey app that says, if it's a post, then handle as a publish. If it's get, handle as a subscribe. Publish is pretty simple. Uh, use WebOB to parse the request. The channel is the path. Look in our subscriptions dictionary uh, to get subscriptions, uh, iterate over them, and put into them, and then return OK. These are all kind of toy examples. right? They work, and they probably work pretty well. But there's plenty of edge cases and assumptions, because it's sort of an educational thing. Um, and so what do those subscriptions come from? When you do a git, it calls handle subscribe, parses uh, uh, web ob requests, sets up channel, creates this thing, creates a subscription, puts it in the dictionary, does this keep alive function we'll talk about in a bit, starts a response 200, and then it starts yielding. Uh, we start iterating over that subscription, that queue, and whenever something comes in the queue, we yield it as a, as a string with a new line. And if none is in there, then we do a, a new line, which is, so this is just like this Twitter streaming API. Um, the new line is uh, just a keep alive. And so that's actually what we do here when we call the keep alive with subscription. Um, basically, this is, auto spawn is just a convenient little decorator that uh, does self.spawn. And uh, so this is going to happen asynchronously. And we loop while the subscription is active, and we just put none in it every uh, keep alive interval. So then we have keep alives. All right, so we have this, uh, I mean, that's not too complicated, right? Um, uh, we can run this and try it out. So I created a, a configuration file that is pretty straightforward. In fact, all of them are, are pretty this simple for these examples. Um, so blah, 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 curl, you know, 8, 8. Give me a channel name. Pycon, very original. Um, so here we have these uh, new lines, and it's just going to sit there until we do something published to it. Hello, everybody. Yeah, I will. One moment. So you can see what I did. And I can do it again and again, and it comes out there. So pretty straightforward, uh, obvious kind of thing. Um, and so we've, we've basically built this HTTP uh, streamer. Um, so where were we here? So but we actually want to do a couple of other things. First, we want to add a WebSocket thing to this, because we can. And then we're going to want to add another thing for fun. So that means we have to manage subscriptions somewhere else. And so we're going to create another service called Message Hub that then uh, contains the HTTP streamer. And then it will contain these other things, a WebSocket streamer and this weird tail viewer thing. So first of all, we'll look at, uh, we'll, we'll go back to our streamer. So instead, now we're, we, uh, instead of creating a subscriptions dictionary, we actually set up a hub. We're past a hub. 
And then you can see, instead of actually doing stuff, we say hub publish and hub subscribe. So hub is now responsible for managing subscriptions and doing actual pub sub stuff. Um, we've got another thing here called HTTP tail viewer. Um, it's pretty similar, except when you connect to it, it does this. Um, and I'm not going to explain what this does. But if you look at it and you're clever, you might see what it's doing. Um, but the important thing, I'll show you what, it's, what it does. The important thing is this WebSocket uh, streamer, which is pretty simple. That's it. Um, it's just another service that uh, uses uh, WS for Pi and creates a WebSocket server and sets up a handler to basically do the same thing that the HTTP streamer did. Hub, subscribe, and then we iterate over it and we send it over there. Um, so if we were to actually run this, and I created a uh, message hub configuration, which again just is service and then instantiates uh, message hub. Um, we can uh, actually connect to it with WebSocket. Let's do that. I know this is really, really tiny. You don't have to see what I'm typing. You just have to see that like stuff is coming out. Because that means it's working. And so I just created a WebSocket object, and I'm going to do on message equals, oh. You never win. Data, data. So now whenever uh, we get a message on this WebSocket, it should print it out there. Um, so if I were to go back and publish some more, publish a bunch, we go back and we see a bunch of hello everybody's. Um, so that's, that was pretty easy. Um, I'm going to, OK, we'll move on. So now what we want to do is we want to make a gateway. We've got this cool generic uh, HTTP uh, uh, pub sub service, and we've got this number client thing. Uh, well, let's combine them to make a number gateway. Um, All right, so uh, we're back here again, and we've got a gateway module. And it has a gateway service. And this thing is pretty simple, like, th there it is. All we're doing is creating a new service, and we're saying create a message hub and create a number client, uh, and add them, and then we do start, and we have bridge. And bridge is uh, just a greenlet that sits in a loop, again, as a client. But for every number, we're going to publish it to uh, the numbers channel. And so what you have is something where you have this message hub you can connect to. I'll just run it. <laughs> so if I were to connect to slash numbers, uh, we're getting numbers out of it. Because we were still running that, in the beginning we ran the numbers server in the background. Um, and then we had the number client. And you can see the, every now and then you get the new line from the keep alive. And so uh, just as easily, you can actually uh, you know, now connect to it you know, with WebSocket as well. And you can see there are numbers coming out of it. Um, and then I'll show you what that, uh, that weird tail, does anybody know what that tail, tail view does by looking at it? So that's what happens when you use uh, multi-part mix replace in a browser. Um, so you're seeing the last, the last thing, and it's just replacing it. Um, OK, so this thing now needs to be distributed. It's not really distributed. You could run a bunch of these, but it wouldn't really make a difference because they'd all be siloed off. Um, so we're going to need to we'll start with the, the message HUD and make it distributed. We're going to make a new a back end. Message, call, we'll call it message backend, um, that will basically let us run a bunch of message hubs and they will all be connected somehow so that when you pub to one, to one channel and you're listening on another one and you're listening on that channel, you'll get the message. And this message backend is made up of two, um, two sub uh, services, a peer transmitter and a peer receiver. 
And now we're going to use ZeroMQ, and you, I missed that last talk, but I imagine it was pertinent to our interests here. Um, so let's do that. Questions so far? So um, G event sleep. So if you actually do a loop that doesn't actually do any, um, that, that happens to not do any I.O., then it's going to, you need to yield somehow because of the greenlets. And so G event sleep zero is how you yield to the other. So if you get uh, in a loop that doesn't actually do any I.O., you need to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. What's that? Can't hear you. When you reload, does it kill connections? Uh, no. If you restart, it will kill connections. Um, reload is just a hook. Basically, the, the runner is sending a signal, and then it calls your reload hook, and then you can do whatever you want. It's going to reload configuration and log configuration, and it will do whatever you want. Um, if you want to do anything more than change configuration, then you would have to handle that yourself. So reload does not kill connections. It just sends you a signal and a nice hook for dealing with it. What's that? Um, I don't know. Maybe it should. Um, but it didn't, so I did this. Um, OK, so what we have here is a new module called Backend. And this is starting to get kind of complicated. But it's not that complicated. It's about 90 lines. Um, so now we have the subscription, which again, wrapping queue, we pulled that out of the other, uh, the, the hub uh, module. And we have a backend service, which we can see on one screen. Um, and it's basically a, a little facade type thing to wrap two other subservices, peer transmitter and peer receiver. Um, and it gives you publish and subscribe, which just defers to transmitter to broadcast that. And subscribe will create a subscription based on the receiver. Um, so first looking at peer transmitter. Uh, peer transmitter is going to take uh, the backend object and pull the cluster uh, off of that. Oh, let's actually. So uh, the way we're going to model a cluster here is with this observable set, which is uh, basically a utility thing here. Um, so we created this generic observable class and then wrapped set, uh, made an observable set. So whenever you add and remove to it, you get a callback if you want to. Um, whoops. So what happens is uh, our peer transmitter, um, when we start up, we actually say, hey, cluster, we're going to attach a connector to it, this guy. It's just going to call connect. And call connect is just going to say, zero MQ socket connect, and it'll just connect to it. So whenever a new thing comes into your cluster, which is defined somewhere else uh, with this observable set, it will connect to it. And then when you broadcast something, we just send a multi-part message uh, of the channel and then a message packed version uh, representation of the message. And receiver is basically what you would be connecting to uh, on any of these other hosts. Um, so we bind to it and we create a socket, or we set up the bind address. We create a socket, subscribe socket. Here's where we actually manage the subscriptions. Uh, when we start, we bind, and then we call uh, listen, which is a loop. We just listen for multi-part messages, and then we do that whole see what subscriptions we have and put them in there. And then we have subscribe and unsubscribe. Uh, which uh, are basically doing the zero MQ subscribe and unsubscribe. Um, so if we if we have that, we can actually, assuming we have a uh, uh, a cluster that somehow changes, um, we we can actually create multiple nodes, and they would all just kind of connect to each other, and they would broadcast all messages to each other using zero MQ, which isn't you know, ideal. Again, this is kind of a toy, but um, we're going to now have to integrate this, because our hub um, is still doing this old stuff. Uh, it's handling publish and subscribe and its subscription. So uh, let's just magically go on to the next chapter. And uh, so now our hub adds backend, uh, message backend as a subservice. Um, and we just defer publish and subscribe requests to it. And so those, those uh, front, sort of front end services that we have, they talk to hub just the same way, and it just all works. Um, and I would love to show you that, but I'm not going to. No, um, 
the, the problem now is that we have to define this cluster somehow. And this is the like, hard part that you would normally use um, uh, uh, Doozer or something like that for, uh, Zookeeper. But we, uh, you know, I just decided, and we don't use this at Twilio, but we just decided for, uh, for fun to create basically a, 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 a service that will provide this for you. So that you can basically say, uh, run a node and give it a, any other node in a cluster, and it will join that cluster, and all the nodes in that cluster will now know about it. And then when any cluster dies, uh, all the others will know about it um, because they all basically connect to a leader. And if the leader dies, it does a really, really simple distributed uh, leader election algorithm that I'll show you. So this service, Cluster Coordinator, um, is made up of two subservices again, because it's sort of this peer-to-peer -peer thing. Sorry. Okay, so here's our cluster coordinator. Um, it has a bunch of stuff like uh, you know, a promoted event exposed via wait for promotion. Uh, it has the current leader. It has some sort of identity. It's now managing our uh, cluster observable set. Um, and it basically runs these two things. A peer server, which uh, is basically a TCP server, and it does a bunch of random stuff to make this sort of made up protocol work. Um, and then we have the peer client, and I, you know, I, I wanted to go into detail um, with some of this stuff, but I can't. I'll show you the leader election, though. So assuming uh, you find out that the leader that you were connected to, so first of all, what happens is you connect to any node. If it's not the leader, it says, hey, th I'm not the leader, this guy is. So you go, okay, I'll connect to that guy. And so then you connect to the leader, and the leader just uh, you know, knows that you're connected. Ideally, you would want some sort of real heartbeats, um, but it just uses the connection. So if you lose the connection to the leader, uh, then everybody's going to go, oh, man, we lost the leader. We have to do a leader election. So it has to do a distributed leader election, which sounds hard. Um, but there's an, there's an easy way that's kind of dumb and works in a lot of cases, but not um, all of them, where you basically take all the hosts that you already know about and sort them because that's a deterministic thing, and you just get a list. Then now they all have all the other hosts, and you just pick the first one off the list. And you all say, okay, that guy's the leader. And then you all, he becomes the leader and you all connect to it. And if you just happen to, for some reason, get another one, um, they will know you connect to them and they'll redirect you to the right one. So it works out. Um, so I will run this. Ignore this broken pipe. Oh, and... Uh, just to show you, we do have the, uh, the uh, our gateway now has a ton of stuff in it. It's got the uh, uh, cluster coordinator, the number client, the message hub, and this weird announcer thing um, that you'll see in a bit. Well, maybe. Actually, so the way this works, uh, cluster, the, the new gateway with this cluster coordinator um, has a has some configuration identity and a leader. So the first time we're actually using the configuration here. Um, and we're basically just pulling it from the environment. So we have to identify it somehow. There's a identity one two seven one and the leader will be myself. So you gotta bootstrap it somehow. And so we got that guy running. Let's make another one. So we got ah. Uh, how did I don't know how that other one worked. Three. 
Okay, so we got three of these guys running. Um, and we can, uh, that announce service is basically, um, again, doing the, we're publishing into a new channel. Um, all the, all, the, uh, all the nodes are basically announcing their presence every second. And they're doing it in order, coordinated um, in a really dumb way. But, um, and then you see the leader is um, number one. And uh, if we were to like use the pub sub stuff, it would all work. But we can actually start, um, let's actually connect to numbers here. So we got some numbers coming out. Notice that um, normally, uh, again, normally all the nodes would have created a connection to the number service, and so you'd be seeing like three times as many numbers here. But because of the leader thing, um, we can actually say in our code some stupid little thing that says, um, uh, if cluster is leader, then, then publish. So, uh, so you only have one guy publishing into the numbers. Um, and if any of these guys die, so let's kill the, you want to kill the leader? All right. So killing the leader. Um, this guy said, new leader, me. And this guy said, uh, new leader, that guy. And you can see the announcer is now announcing just three and two. Two is the leader. And our numbers are still coming out. We're connected to three, though. If we, if we kill three, we're going to lose this connection. Um, but you can see we can actually kill. Well, let's add back the, the first guy, right? We can't. Uh, our leader is not one. Let's, let's connect to three. Oh, man. Ugh. All right. So now we're connected to one of these guys. So now all the family is back together and, uh, and everything's still working. And we could kill this guy again. We could kill two. Um, and so eventually three is going to be like, what the hell? Uh, oh, I'm the leader. And we're still going. And three is still there. The only one left. He is the leader. And uh, our numbers are still going. If we kill three, we lose. Whoops. We lose everything. So uh, we more or less accomplished uh, what we were going for, the announcement thing. We made a gateway to a random number service built around self folder And it, it, you know, I know we didn't, like the code was pretty simple. And it was simple because uh, it was broken down into these little pieces, right? And not only do you get this advantage of, of simple code, but you can actually now reuse them and recompose them in different ways. Um, so if you're interested in this, in this Ginkgo, Ginkgo thing, it's actually open source and we're rewriting it. It's, I mean, it's really simple. Uh, we've been using it for a while. Um, and we, it'd be nice to build some higher level primitives, like real versions of the stuff that we just saw that you could use in sort of like a standard library for building distributed systems. Um, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it, if there's any questions now. First of all, I enjoyed the fact you used Git to progress on the slides. Um, two questions. First of all, the, the logic in distributed systems and tends to uh, split on different nodes. How do you debug them uh, in means of logging and things like that? Um, I mean, yeah. You, you end up with all kinds of crazy, uh, like, different, uh, it's hard. Um, Debugging, I don't have a, a great answer to other than the, the, normal, the normal things. And the second question, um, how do you handle service invocation on different servers? Service invocation? Like now uh, you've defined a way to, that services have uh, different services that are dependent on, and they can invoke each other. Yeah. But they're doing it on a single server. So, um, I mean, this is kind of an inter interesting example. Uh, you talk about uh, service invocation. Um, Please remain a little bit quiet if you don't mind. Step out of the hall if you need to talk. Um, for example, we didn't really do any RPC calls to any other service. 
the only uh, uh, the only real communication we were doing across nodes was um, PubSub with ZeroMQ, and then we had this uh, t weird TCP protocol. Um, but if we actually wanted to, for example, we're working on a way to, to basically turn any uh, service in Ginkgo into uh, something that you can call remotely. You know, not a new idea, but the idea would be to make it really simple and use something like ZeroMQ. Um, so there are a lot of ways you could do it. Uh, you have a lot of options, and we're thinking of ways to sort of do that with ZeroMQ in a very like minimalistic, transparent way. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, could you speak a little bit to your experiences with GEvent and sort of how it's been treating you guys? Um, so we used Twisted before. Sure. Um, and that led to a lot of interesting things, uh, problems. <laughs> um, and so when we, when, when we found uh, GEvent, it was actually quite uh, nice. First of all, conceptually, it's much simpler. Um, and it lets you think in a, a much more traditional sort of way of thinking um, without some of the disadvantages of actually using threads. Um, you, you, you have to be aware of what's going on. You know, you have to know if, something, if th something's going to be called, it's going to yield. Um, but that's, uh, you know, if you, if you, so far it's been, if we keep these modules very simple, it's very obvious what's going on. Um, so we haven't really run into any problems with uh, GEvent uh, specifically uh, yet. Uh, we ran into some problems with the ZeroMQ bindings, um, but there's a, there's a patch uh, fix for those. Um, but for example, you do have to use like a, the, the GEvent ZeroMQ library to make that work. Um, and then of course, running into things like, oh, we can't use this you know, C version of the MySQL client and stuff like that. Um, which, uh, you know, in some, we might handle in ways, uh, for example, thinking in terms of services, uh, normally you might uh, not talk, ideally, in a service oriented architecture, you might not talk to a database directly, uh, remotely, you would have a service in front of it, right? And that service could be written in anything, Go or C or whatever, but it's really simple, and then your services talk to that via some RPC mechanism. Um, and so thinking about, well, if we did that, but we did it in the same process, um, we could just say we were creating a service that is in another thread or in another process. Um, and so then we could use that blocking library. So one of the things we're talking about doing is uh, having Ginkgo uh, abstract concurrency engines. So you can use GEvent, or you could use Eventlet, or you could use real threads, or you could use real processes. A multi-process uh, uh, a multi-process service would basically say whenever you add a, so add a service, it would create another process and run it in there and sort of just take care of everything for you. Um, so yeah, that... Sounds great. It's, it's been really fun. Cool. I like it. Thanks.